Welcome to the British Library. Uh, welcome to our audience here in the flesh and to people watching from home. I'm Libby Purvis, and tonight is a celebration of the life and work and legacy of the great theatre agent Peggy Ramsey. Uh, some may have seen the play uh, Peggy for you lately at the Hampstead Theatre. Uh, anyone who loves the theatre will be grateful to her, should be grateful to her, for her mentoring and chivying and appreciating and supporting many of the greatest 20th century playwrights, from Aikbourne to Orton to Ionesco. A lot of those names will come up tonight, I think. Uh, Peggy Ramsey's archive, of course, is housed here at the British Library. Uh, just before I introduce the panel, some brief housekeeping notes. If you're here in person, please switch phones off or to silent. If you're at home and you have questions, which we would very much welcome, please submit them via the box below the video on your screen, and we will do our best to get through them. Um, the panel here now. We have an agent, a playwright, director, screenwriter, and an actor-director, all with their perspectives. Uh, Mel Kenyon was literary manager of the Royal Court and joined the agency Casarotto Ramsey and Associates in 1992, therefore taking over many of Peggy's clients, which is a list to make anybody gasp. And seems, seems to have been incredibly cool about it, aren't you? Um, well, I've been doing it for 30 years, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well. The excitement's worn off. Actually, the excitement has the excitement has not worn off, boys. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was 1992. Um, uh, so Christopher Hampton is, of course, playwright, screenwriter, translator, film director. He's lately uh, given us marvelous translations of Florian Zeller, uh, and of course his Dangerous Liaisons and the Father versions won Oscars for screenplay. Um, his career also, I believe, began under the representation of Peggy with uh, your play. Your yes. first play, When Did You Last See My Mother? That's right, yes. Yeah. And not least, Simon Callow, tremendous actor who, uh, partly spurred by his friendship with Peggy, also became a formidable writer. You may know his books about Charles Lawton and Orson Welles, but the strangest, most formidable bit of writing, I always think, is a book called Love Is Where It Falls. It, it knocks me out every time. Um, it's an account of his passionate friendship with Peggy Ramsey through the last 13 years of her life. When they met, I think... Uh, she was 70, you were 30. Mm -hmm. um, but the connection in meetings and letters is the most breathtaking account of a deep, passionate friendship that you will ever encounter. So we thought, to set the scene, we would ask him to read a bit of the very beginning of that book, Love is Where It Falls, where the young actor, a bit nervous, arrives in her office just to collect a copy of a play. It was a sunny summer's morning in 1980 when for the first time I ascended the spindly staircase festooned with posters of theatrical triumphs past that led to Margaret Ramsay Limited in Goodwin's Court off St. Martin's Lane in the centre of the West End of London. I had come to collect a copy of a play in which I had acted a couple of years before in the theatre and which I now hoped to persuade the BBC to do on television. Straight ahead of me, at the top of three flights of stairs was the door with the agency's name on it, under several layers of murky varnish. The last thing I expected or wanted to do was to talk to Peggy Ramsey herself. But when I opened the door, there she unmistakably was, sitting at a desk, or rather on one, as she flicked through a script, almost hitting the pages in her impatience to make them turn quicker. Her skirt was drifting up round the middle of her thighs to reveal knee-high stockings. Hearing me enter, she looked up with an expression which seemed to mingle surprise, amusement and challenge, as if she'd been expecting me but had rather doubted I'd have the courage to come. It was a curiously sexy look. Hello, I said. I'm, I know exactly who you are, dear, she said. Tell me, she continued, as if resuming a conversation rather than beginning one, do you think Akebourne will ever write a really good play? <laughs> it's an interesting question, I replied nervously, slightly inhibited by the fact that I was at that moment appearing in a play by the author under discussion <laughs> and that he was by far the most successful client of the woman asking the question. You'd better come in, she said, calling over her shoulder for tea and cake to one of the young ladies in the office as she ushered me into what was evidently her private office. Adjusting and readjusting her skirt, a flowery item, beige, silk, and diaphanous, she kicked off her shoes and seated herself at her desk 
while I settled down on the sofa. Ah, oh, that sofa, she murmured mysteriously, <laughs> with many a nod and a smile as she absentmindedly combed her fine golden hair. The room had an air of glamorous chaos about it, half a workplace, half boudoir. There were shelves and shelves of scripts right up to the ceiling, their authors' names boldly inscribed in red down the spine. In one quick glance, I saw Adamov, Bond, Churchill, Hampton, Hare, Rudkin. There were books in great tottering piles, awards, both framed and in statuette form, posters, all of autumn, Littles in Flemish, Mortimer on Broadway, plants everywhere, trailing unchecked, discarded knee-high stockings, scarves, <laughs> hairbrushes, makeup bags, mirrors and hats. Huge, wide-brimmed, ribbon-toting hats, four <laughs> or five of them draped over the furniture. The air was headily fragrant, confirming the room's overpoweringly feminine aura. Is it, that's enough? Or, or, or <laughs> did you want me to go on a bit? <laughs> go, go, on a, go on a little bit. Well, I'll just go on one nice tiny bit more. <laughs> so in the midst of it all was Peggy, clearly the source of both the glamour and the chaos. She was now answering the telephone in a startlingly salty manner. Well, you'll just have to tell them to fuck off, dear, she was saying to one corner. I shall tell Merrick that we must have a million to another. But your play's no good, dear, she cried to a third, informing me in an entirely audible aside, it's bold. I'm telling him his play's no good. <laughs> Then informing him, I've got Simon Callow here, and I'm telling him, your play's no good. <laughs> Whatever the response was, it made her chuckle richly. Well, it isn't, dear, is it? There were more calls, all rapidly dispatched. To my astonishment, she seemed to think that talking to me, and even more surprising, listening to me, was more important than the day-to-day -day business of running the most successful play agency in the country, perhaps the world. She dismissed that in a phrase, the word agent, she said, is the most disgusting word in the English <laughs> language. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Mel. <laughs> <laughs> the woman who took I over. Know, I, I actually agree with her. I have never said when anybody says what you do, I've never said I I'm an agent. I say I, I, I look after uh -huh. writers and directors. Ah, they say you're an agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I go, yeah. <laughs> so you use quite a lot to live up to in terms of image and underwear thrown Yeah, I, I don't floor. think our dress sense is at all the same. <laughs> yes, I'm just glancing up and Yeah, glancing I'm not a purple girl. but streamlined um, modern. Yes, I, I, I've often wondered if we'd actually have got on. I think we, sh we, we share some things in common. But she didn't really like other women. No. So um, the only thing that the only reason she might have liked me was I'm actually gay, so I wouldn't have competed for any of the men that she rather adored. <laughs> we might have got on. I can't quite tell. But she did tell <laughs> Carol Churchill that women couldn't write at which point. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Christopher, over your your years with with Peggy, does, does, does that description ring true? Does that entirely feel entirely? <laughs> um, I, I was very very young when I first met her. I'd written this play called When Did You Last See My Mother? And it had been put on by undergraduates at Oxford. And, uh, <clears throat> and in those days, miraculously, the newspapers used to come and give you reviews, uh, even if you were you know, an amateur uh, ALDS production. So, so th there was a question of you know, having an agent. And I was forwarded to the general manager of the Oxford Playhouse, a very nice woman called Liz Sweeting, and she said, there's only one agent in the country worth talking to, and that's Peggy Ramsey, and I, I'll, I'm happy to send your play to her. So fine. So a couple of weeks went by. I was in, in a, a student at New College, Oxford. I had a ground floor room. It was a nice day. I was sitting in the window. And one of those chaps in bowler hats um, uh, came across the quad and said, are you Hampton? I said, yes. He said, phone call for you. <laughs> now, n this was not their job, was to traipse around the college finding undergraduates to... <laughs> 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 Never been known. Uh, so somebody of... Inc uh, well, first of all, I thought somebody had died in my family. <laughs> uh, uh, but then it became clear that somebody of in intense forcefulness 
had ordered this book for them <laughs> to go and find me, which she did. So I went on the phone. She said, I like your play. I said, oh, good. That's, that's, I'm delighted. She said, come to London tomorrow. I said, well, I, I think there's a lecture on Baudelaire. She said, fuck Baudelaire, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Get on the train. Uh, well, I expect to see you at about 11. So uh, it, the, the, I then walked up the stairs exactly as Simon described them and was shown in and was told about the famous sofa. And um, <laughs> uh, it was, it was extra she was extraordinary. She picked up the phone, shouted at people, and literally while I was there, she uh, rang up William Gaskell at the Royal Court and sort of more or less ordered him to put my play on. <laughs> uh, and um, anyway, it was a marvelous conversation. She was, she was just, her mind was so wide ranging. At a certain point, she, she had, there was a big handbag. She always had huge handbags. She leant over sideways and plunged her arm into the handbag, came up with a handful of five pound notes and said, there you are, dear. <laughs> I, I said, well, uh, it's all right, I've got a day return. <laughs> she, said, she said, well done, dear, you passed the test. <laughs> we, want to, we want to get at something of that great personality, and one of the ways is really, I always think, through Simon's book, because she took to you. I mean, you were 30 and not yet famous. She was 70 and very famous, and you turn up in her office like that, and from that moment, she just seems to have taken to you in a, uh, and you took, to each, you, took, you took to each other, you somehow kind of needed each other. It's an extraordinary friendship to read about. Well, it was just extraordinary to realize that it was happening to me. I mean, we had this extraordinary encounter here, which, uh, uh, I think every encounter with Peggy was, extraordinary for anyone um, because she was so surprising all the time but of course it didn't it didn't immediately happen but uh, but after a very short space of time I suddenly realized that this was a passion had ignited in her and I had never had an experience of that <coughs> I'd had plenty of you know, affairs relationships and things like that but to be exposed to that blast of, 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 of emotion <coughs> and intensity, <coughs> that was really quite something. Uh, but I, I did, as you say, find that I had a capacity to answer it, to, to, to rise to it. And so, mm. in a sense, I sort of, not really wittingly, but inevitably, fanned the flames. And she, and it raged for, well, many years. Uh, and, uh, um, perhaps never really ever did die out. And the exchange of letters, quite <coughs> extraordinary. Um, with, I mean, they're, they're lovers' letters, but you weren't <coughs> lovers because you, you were gay and she was, she was 70 and so on. But, but they are absolutely that passion. I've, uh, there's, there's one phrase which I, I, I sort of knocks you back in the book where you have read, because she was very generous in her appreciation of talent. I think that's obviously something Mel... Agents have to be, don't they? They have to. Well, they the, have good, to, the good ones are. They have to be able to reach out and, and sort of love somebody for what they do, well, you like have a to good, love them. like a very good, you know, yeah. a, a good writer or critic yeah. maybe does. You know, so I just, you know, I, I, want, I need you. I love you. Yeah. Um, but you read the Shakespeare sonnets, and she suddenly sends this message saying, "Your reading has, your performance has scorched me like a forest fire, and I am finding it hard to recover." That's extraordinary, isn't it? That's that's not the kind of message that. <laughs> no, a young chap gets from <laughs> from no, someone no. who isn't even his agent. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, um, but I, 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 I remember. It's been, it felt like being in an opera, actually, where, where suddenly this huge phrase of extraordinary intensity and urgency would emerge from her, and I'd sort of join in uh, as <laughs> if it was a duet, you know, and rise. So it was La Bohème, or it was Tosca, or something, and and. Um, she had, of course, been an opera singer. Yes, absolutely. Carl Rosa Touring Company. Yeah. Um, and as I told you the other day, yeah. I, I uh, once said to her, well, what were you like, Peggy? What, what were you like as an opera singer? She said, well, dear, I wasn't very good, but I was very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, uh, were you frightened? Were you frightened at any point no. when it started? You never felt never, frightened? Never, no. I, I, I've, 
I grew up entirely surrounded by women, yeah. immensely strong women, of intensely forceful yeah. personalities. So in a way, it was a bit Coming like home. being yeah. uh, yes, yeah. a bit like that, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, because I was the also the only child, the male and a male child at that, there was a special kind of energy around me, sometimes uh, appalled energy, and, and, and I, uh, I was, you know, had to be, you know, bottled up somehow, or, 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 or very often, most often, an encouraging energy. And, uh, but there are these small panics <coughs> in the book, there are these small panics, because, I mean, there's, you have partners, you have... Yeah, well, that's the Aziz, thing. Though, there's, a, there's the tragedy of Aziz happens through, through the book. Yes, I... I but, but she then has to be, she's got to get a grip on him as well, and meet him, and be there, and be part of your well, total life, and this is terrible. That's when it got very, it? very difficult, Powerful. and, and, and that, that, of course, applied to the writers as well. Mm. Um, because, as you said, Mel, it, it, it's, and you both said, it's love. I mean, she f fell in love with the writer and the writer's writing yeah. uh, and as, as a sort of gestalt. Mm. And, and so with me, um, it, it, I was indeed very uh, deeply in love, actually, with a, with a young man, a rather exotic young man. Uh, um, and uh, Peggy was... In, in enormously disturbed by that fact, but at the same time <laughs> sought to kind of absorb him mm. as well. And then you know, finding that he was a student of film at Beaconsfield, uh, she then suddenly started, and I'll, uh, you know, well, I'll meet, I'll introduce you to Sam, him to Sam Spiegel. And we'll, and you, I, I, well, yeah. I, I, maybe not. Uh, Peggy, <laughs> maybe not <laughs> absolutely the best thing to do. But, 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 but it was, <laughs> and it was, on the brink of destructive, because she just didn't think that he was worthy of me in the terms in which she thought of love. That is to mm. say, it wasn't oceanic as it was with her. And yet the constructive side, which we just talked to uh, Sir Christopher about as well, and, and, and to Mel, is, um, I mean, uh, I, I did notice the bit where you have done your first attempt at writing something. You've written a piece <laughs> for the Evening Standard, <laughs> and Peggy goes over it, <laughs> uh, because she is basically in charge of you in her head and changes things absolutely brilliantly and correctly, but then does a rather wrong sentimental sentence at the end, which they eventually cut, and yeah. you realise that she was a maker of writers, yes. but not a writer. Mm. Although, as you said, her letters are extraordinary, as e even as literature. I mean, they're fantastic. In that little collection we put together fr from the collection here at the British Library, uh, she, I mean, it's oh, your phrase about the, the scorched, like a, a, etc. I mean, it's it, uh, she. She was remarkable, but but what was <laughs> particularly memorable about that occasion is she did. This is this is her famous gesture. I tried to get Tamsin to do this in the play, but she she couldn't find a way of uh, balancing all the props. But she'd she'd take her glasses off to read, you see, and she'd go like this with her hands on that, the the the, the arm or whatever you call that of the of the and then. <laughs> and, and so she was reading this thing. Oh, this is this piece for the Evening Standard. And she said, Did you mean it to be so boring? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Christopher, tell me about, as a, as a writer working with her, I mean, r writers do not like usually being pushed about. And she things change and edited. How was that for you? Well, I mean, I, you, you know, it was no good being a client of Peggy's and not wanting to be, you know, <laughs> objecting <laughs> to being pushed about. Mm -hmm. She would ring at 8.30 in the morning and say, are you working? <laughs> <coughs> Sometimes the phone would ring and you'd pick it up and there'd be a ter terrible silence. And then she'd say, listen, Keith, am I ringing you or are you ringing me? <laughs> <coughs> So you never knew what was going to come next. But the, the moment of greatest fear was when you handed your new play to her. Because, um, you know, if she didn't like it, I think it's fair to say she told you. <laughs> in, no, in no uncertain terms. Um, and so it was always a, uh, it was, you know, and I was, very, you know, I was very lucky because she tended mostly to like them. And... Uh, and that was, there was a huge relief. But occasionally you'd write, write we should, she would, I wrote a television play once and she didn't really like the whole idea of television or film and wondered why anybody bothered with them. But uh, anyway, she read this television play, it was an original television play, rang me up and said, uh, well, this isn't, this is really not very good, dear. I said, oh, I, I did a lot of research and I, I, I feel it's, I haven't quite, you know, made it. Mm. 
absorbed all of that, but I, I think basically it's an it's a, basically an interesting idea. You said it is not an interesting. <laughs> <idea>. <laughs> So Simon gives us, near the end, uh, finding after her death, her commonplace book, where she'd written little poems and notes on, notes on Freud and Jung and Sartre, and quotations about how drama works, uh, and Aristotle's poetics, and the, uh, the way to speed the story on, and don't tell show, and let it happen on stage. I mean, a absolute goldmine of of principles and ideas yes, and, and, and what, what understanding of what drama yes, is. Yes, and what you discovered from that was that she did, it didn't, she didn't leap fully formed as a, as a, 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 a critic of, of, mm. of, of drama. She had really worked hard at it. Because remember, she'd been an actress, then she'd been an, a, a manager of a theater, uh, and which often did new plays, the questers, and, and uh, she was, um, she, she knew that she wasn't an actress, she knew that she wasn't uh, a, a singer, and yet she was profoundly engaged with drama, and it turned out she was a, a, advising people kind of spontaneously, uh, managers, about plays that they might put on. She would say, Edward Sutro, she would say, do, do, do that play, dear, that's the one to do. And people began to see her judgment was extraordinarily good, and she was no respecter of reputations. So, so she was as interested in the play, or more interested in the play by a new writer, because it was that same thing. She, she wanted to feel the, the gust of, 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 of passion, something new, and, 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 and uh, the more subversive it was, the happier she w she'd be about it. Yes, we, we should sketch, Mill, what it is a, a play agent does, because you, know, you tend to think, oh, yes, finds a good play. You know, a, a, a literary agent finds a novel, likes a novel, sells it to a publisher, and it's kind of over. You know, the, mm. the publisher does it, and the agent gets some money. But it's you have to negotiate um, fees and terms, and then check up the plays working, and, and then deal with producers, deal with theatres. I mean, that, that, that's all part of it, isn't it? Well, you're, you kind of, you're, you're, um, you're like an octopus. Well, <laughs> you, you kind of do everything. I mean, and also, I think... I, I think um, I think, I mean, I don't know, Christopher and Simon may completely disagree. I think there's a very lovely, I mean, uh, we call ourselves literary agents, even though actually we're playwrights agents. But there's a very lovely relationship that you can forge together. So it is like falling in love. I always, I've always said to the younger, you know, young, younger agents who are coming through, I said, you know, you don't, when they kind of go, oh, I quite like this play. I think, well, don't take them on, darling. You've got to fall in love. You've got to meet them. You, so And often, I think, the spirit of the work, so when you first read a work, and remember you haven't met somebody, so you read a playwright of 22, often I responded to the spirit of the work, so you obviously respond to the writing itself and whether they've got a dramatic instinct and all of those sorts of things, but there's something that feeds the work, and you can feel plays if you really got used to reading them and knew sensate. You can feel a play. So often when you fall in love with the play, you are going to fall in love in some extraordinary way with the person who walks through the door. And it can cement itself in 30 seconds. You think, oh, well, we're going to spend the next... to know which producer, which and then director when done, when might you, well, possibly well, when love you've it done as that, much. Then the chemistry starts. So then um, when you're really good at it, I kind of think you're like an alchemist. You kind of start putting the ingredients together. So, um, uh, and you do that, you know, obviously as playwrights become increasingly well established they've then forged those relationships themselves and some of that falls away as they get um, more and more established but when they're little yeah. you're putting <laughs> them in the right place with the right people at the right time right right up the other end and I mean I don't yeah. know, so Christopher you, you won't have happened to you because um, you're still firing on all cylinders but there's a terrifying moment in the play and it also it turns up in, in the book where one of her one of her clients dies a playwright and she really doesn't care at all, because he wasn't doing any more good work. That that was it. He was he was finished, darling. Um, <laughs> he, he was gone. Yes, I. I, I uh, this is in Alan Plater's play, uh, and I th I think it was a misunderstanding, um, because I, I remember when uh, it was only about a year after I joined her, um, Joe Orton was murdered by his friend Kenneth Halliwell. And, uh, and he, you know, it was a great, to, you know, Peggy had to go and identify the body and it, bodies and everything. 
and she appeared to be quite extraordinarily callous at that point. She, so I remember being very shocked about a week after this happened when she said to me, well, dear, he was starting to repeat himself, Joe. I don't think he would have got any better. Uh, I think he would have just written the same play over and over again. Um, and it, it, it somewhere along the, her st saying that, it became clear to me that she was, this was her way of dealing mm. with grief, mm -hmm. that she was profoundly <coughs> upset and the only way to sort of deal with it was to, was to say, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Or, you know, it's a zoo for it, it's done, yeah. And I think that was, you know, people knew, you know, she said it to everybody, so people knew about that. And I think that was um, the misunderstanding in the, in the play, which I think otherwise is, is often very accurate about her. Um, but I, I think she, she was not in any, in any sense unfeeling. If she was ever unfeeling, it was only to protect herself from the gale force of her, mm. of her actual feeling. Is that right? Yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. So of course, Although the, there's always a saying that, that writers, a writer has to have a chip of ice somewhere. Yes. You know, has, and I suppose an agent, to some extent, has to as well. I mean, there's going to come a point with some writers when you're going to have to say, yeah. not this time. As I mean, so I, I, ki I kind of, um, and I hope I haven't misremembered this because I haven't read the letters for a while. But I remember reading one of the letters and, you know, sh she lamented being an agent because actually emotionally y y you do have a big family. You know, you have a big family of a lot of people that you invest a lot of time and energy in. And if you do it properly, you, you love them. And it's exhausting. So I think, um, you know, I think not that you have a chip of ice, but there are times where you have to protect yourself against, you can find yourself with few emotional reserves l left. And also, I think you can find yourself having no personal life at all because you are so completely fulfilled and engaged by what's going on around you that actually you can easily neglect your personal life unless you really make the effort not to. It's quite an extraordinarily all-encompassing job. But then, you see, it's so fascinating. The into it comes a friendship. There may have been earlier similar ones, I don't know, but friendships like the one, the one with Simon, where, I mean, you're, you're sitting drinking together in, into the night um, and, and having strange picnics and got on gardens and so on, and then she's up working early. She's back in the office early in the morning and everything's going on. She... She didn't spare herself, did she? At any at any oh, stage, it didn't, doesn't seem to me. She no, you know, she had a, the personal relationship, the friendship, the I you know the, this exciting conversation we're having. You know, we're absolutely getting there. You know, and then all this work to do. I mean, this is this is a powerhouse of yeah. uh, almost hysterical energy. Uh, oh, I wouldn't call it hysterical. No, it, it, that I would not have said of her. Uh, but it was it was a powerhouse, no question about that. I don't think she believed much in sleeping, did she? No, <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> and she always went to sleep with a with a play in her hand. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, she, uh, in addition to what you've just said, during you know the time we, she and I knew each other, uh, not only would she uh, have these passionate conversations, drink with me, blah 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 blah, but then at six thirty in the morning she'd leave a little offering for me on the doorstep of, uh, it might be a, 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 a basket of eggs or a, a, um, a, some perfume or something or a book or something extraordinary, exquisitely wrapped up with a, with a, a note of, of great, great passion. And then she walked into work every day. She lived in Earl's Court. She walked into uh, work every day uh, uh, barefoot very extraordinary because she'd suffered very badly from bunions <laughs> and so she would take off her shoes and just march down the streets down down uh, Knightsbridge and on to the office in um, a Goodwin's court <coughs> she and and when she got cancer of the breast she didn't stop working at all as far as I know she was having chemotherapy she was having uh, all sorts of drugs uh, to counter it, and uh, she still came into work, I think, every single day, walked into work every day. So there was just this titanic discipline uh, in the woman as well. 
Uh, but I don't, I mean, Christopher, you, you, didn't, you didn't get strange presents left on your step or anything, did you? Um, uh, no, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> maybe maybe the, <laughs> the playwright didn't do it. Well, no, I was the one, when she finally got to the office, I, she then would, you know, I was the one she then rang up and berated for still being <laughs> in bed. Uh, so <laughs> it's slightly different. Uh, but she was very, very devoted, I think. And you know, uh, it, it's interesting how she made a tremendous effort to be to be to be uh, fascinated with all aspects of life, but in, but but not always successfully. She used to <laughs> she used to come and stay. My my wife and I bought a a, a, a sort of a rect old rectory in Oxfordshire, and she used to come for the weekend. And we had we just had our first child, uh, who was in her high chair, and. Peggy would sort of stare mysteriously. <laughs> She'd say things like, do you feed him fish, dear? <laughs> She'd say, no, Peggy, it's a girl, and she's on, still on, she's not on solids yet. Not on solids? <laughs> oh. And then she would think about this, and she'd say, do you bring him up on sprot? <laughs> it was a completely baffling question, until, until you thought about it for five minutes and worked out that she meant Spock. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, yeah, so she was not, so, as it were, ordinary life <laughs> had kind of passed away. She was baffled by the phenomenon of people getting married anyway. What do you want to get married for, dear? Uh, and famously <laughs> said, uh, was some, one of her clients was going to New York for the Tonys and mentioned to Peggy that he was taking his wife. And she said, what are you doing that for, dear? It's like taking a ham sandwich to a banquet. <laughs> 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 something which which comes out in all all accounts of her, um, which uh, is is extraordinary, is that that business that yes maybe the, the minutiae of life and baby care and the sort of stuff like that just meant nothing to her. But she something which any of us who get emotional in theatres will recognise this feeling that you have to embrace life with all the tragedy and all the harshness and all the horribleness and all the death mm. and all the humiliation and disappointment if you're ever to feel any joy, mm. you know, and that, that yeah. felt I essential theatre to me. Great. Yeah, um, um, uh, um, and I think, you know, that, that it, it was a part, of, part of the tragic view of life. She, she really, there was, there was a dark thread of despair in Peggy, which was the exact count mm. counterbalance of the of this passion for the new. That she loved the new. That was you know, that's why she loved Diaghilev so much because he was always looking for what is new, and uh, that that exhilarated her so much. And she and she ha had lots of famous phrases about that. That that, that n new art, n new art of any quality is always shocking mm. and seems ugly. Yeah, yes. so ugly, that's yeah. the word yeah. she yeah. Used, yeah. used, yes. It was, and, and like the Rite of Spring, blah, blah. And, and, and um, she, she uh, that, to sort of feel herself in the presence of something new and, and, and dangerous and difficult and ugly was very, very exciting to her. But also she's absolutely right. I mean, you know, as we go into increase, increasingly kind of a world where everybody has to feel, uh, and nobody wants to feel any discomfort. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one's very aware that art can't flourish under those circumstances. Yeah. And the best work is, is does make you feel dangerous. It, it does feel dangerous the first time, or unexpected yeah. or shocking the first time you read it. Yeah, yeah. And it should. I mean, art should discomfort. Yeah. But can you, do you, Nell, as an agent, because you're, you're doing the job that she was yeah. doing, you see, and you're such different personality from everything I can see. Well, you know, I'm just... Or have met today. Just not wearing my purple dress today. <laughs> <laughs> but do I haven't you, had my hair done. Do yes. you find, when you read, or in fact when you see plays, even if you've done all the nitty-gritty of the money and the producer and the, the rows and the yeah. agents and the contracts, do you dig deep? I mean, do you, do you find yourself moved sort of in a, oh, yes. a really uh, dangerous personal way. I mean, way. Te te terrifyingly, um, ter te I'm terrifyingly emotional, yes. I ca I, it's, um, and it's quite, it, it's quite extraordinary and sometimes very unexpected, because also you don't really want to be, you know, sitting in those lovely store seats crying your eyes out um, as the agent, but you might find yourself doing that, or 
or you, um, I've perfected a wolf whistle because sometimes I'm terribly overexcited, so there's nothing for it but a good wolf whistle. <laughs> um, uh, and, and it always gets the audience on their feet. It's extraordinary. Um, it's like, you know, a whistle to a dog. Um, so it's, uh, I was once told off by Ian Rickson for being over-enthusiastic at my own client's play, um, which I thought was a bit rich. Uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 and also remember that you may well have read the piece of work 18 months before and may even have been the first person who's read it other than probably a lover and a mother, right? And so you've lived with this thing, but you've lived with your perception of this thing. And so there's nothing more exhilarating than... Um, because you have to imagine everything in 3D, you have to, you can tell, for example, if a playwright only hears the words, you can, you know very well if a playwright sees, you know, all of those sorts of things, because you have to imagine it fully, you have to play the rhythms, you do the accents, I'm very good at accents in my head, you do all of those things, and then you see it fully realised, and there's nothing more exhilarating, and, and it's very exhilarating if actually you have succeeded in your, in the, you know, while reading it yourself, to kind of have fully realized it in your imagination and then you see it on stage and then it's extraordinary. So you never lose that sense of wonder. I mean, it's your church, it's your religion, it's extraordinary. So Christopher, how, how, what about you? Because you, I mean, you have translated and, uh, and adapted plays of enormous, I mean, the, the father, you know, sort of knocked everybody sideways and, and the, the mother as well, for these the Florenzella plays and other plays. Do you... Uh, how do you deal with the emotion of it, you know, when it's a job and it has to be done and it has to be done right? I mean, is, is, that, is that a sort of a question of digging around, uh, stopping well, you yourself to, being emotional? You have to feel everything as intensely as you can, but of course you have to kind of clock off at a certain point because otherwise you'd be consumed by it. But, but I, think, I think the energy and the emotion that you feel uh, um, w when you're writing or translating a, a, a masterpiece of some sort um, that's that's what you do that's sort of what you do it for I mm. suppose or that's what you're addicted to uh, um, but then one and you know Flaubert said you have to pour all your poison and good and bad feelings and every, uh, you know your emotions into a piece of work so as, so as you're able to lead as calm a life as possible <laughs> yes uh, uh, which I've always thought you know I've always tried you tried to live by. <laughs> but you, you need to be scorched, don't you, Simon? You I mean, do. actors, I mean, if you talk to actors and opera singers, it's always fascinating talking to opera singers about how much can they allow themselves to feel at a particular moment, and that happens to actors as well, doesn't it? How, yeah. how deep are you going into this? Because, you know, you've got to get, speak the lines and get off the stage at the right time. Well, I, I, as an actor, what happens a lot is when you're working on the play, either in rehearsal or, or away from the rehearsal room, you can become completely overtaken by the emotion. I mean, which is a rather wonderful experience. But in, in fact, th that emotion rather overwhelms the play. So it's, it's, it, it has to be contained and has to be refined and mm. you have to be able to access it. But, uh, but certainly there's a moment for me when, when I read a part that, I'm, that I've been mm. excited by and start to learn it, particularly as you start to learn it and it becomes internal. Uh, then, then you can get a little bit out of control. <laughs> and the idea of Peggy, yes. I mean, as I say, the, the book. Before we go to the, the, the floor, I should mention again that the, the book "Love Is Where It Falls" is is the most extraordinary account of uh, a great love, a loving, passionate relationship, which is also a trap. I mean, uh, you, you're trapped, and you want to be trapped. I mean, that, that's how it is, isn't it? And, and Oh, I didn't really feel trapped by it, but it is, uh, I mean, yes, uh, it was oh, slightly addictive, but, but um, it, 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 of course, Peggy started to get uh, older and visibly older as the relationship went on, and she then took much more comfort in, because she too had a relationship, you see, with, with a, a, an actor, ex-actor called Bill Roderick, mm -hmm. um, who was a a really old style, hail fellow, well met kind of solid chap, 
and had been very sexy in his day. It was the Roderick brothers were known, the twins were, were known as you know, ladies, men, and all of that kind of thing. And they'd, Peggy had had a very passionate affair with Bill, and then it had sort of died, and she'd sent him off to America as Paul Schofield's understudy <laughs> in um, Man for All Seasons. <laughs> and then he took over the part of uh, Thomas More on, 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 on the tour. And uh, the American tour. And then he came back to England, and Peggy always expressed it as she'd sort of felt, took pity on him as if he was sort of an animal, like a, a dog or something that she brought into the house. And, 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 but she didn't really acknowledge him publicly. But as she got older, she started to do so much more. And I, I know they had evenings, quiet evenings together, which was a very un petty <laughs> idea. Uh, and they lived, uh, they had a house in Brighton as well, where they went every weekend. But <coughs> it, that became very tender. And then, then Bill died, predeceased her. And she said that remarkable thing to uh, David Hare. She said, um, it was, she was already, you know, she, the, the Alzheimer's was beginning to, to creep up on her. But, but she, said, um, she said, I suppose dying prepares you for dying. And uh, um, just she'd watched Bill. Um, yeah. Yeah, but she, she died very um, gracefully. Uh, we, I, I, uh, we weren't there. But I, I mean, David and I managed to, we, we tipped off and we were around. And so we went immediately after she died. We didn't actually see her die. But, 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 but she, had, she did face it as she prescribed. Mm. She just took it on board. Saying you just take embrace life in everything, mm. but I love I love another description. I'll quote from your book before we go to the floor. That uh, next to Peggy, sometimes every, everyone seemed less less passionate, <laughs> less perceptive, less brilliant, less honest, less absolute. And I thought, right, I'm never going to be careful how I talk to anyone again. <laughs> I'm going to tell them everything I feel about them here and now. Be very afraid. Um, let's see if anybody here would like to come up with the first question. Yes, sir. Uh, I think they're going to bring your microphone so everyone at home can hear as well. I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about the business side of things from the point of view that you get to the top of any profession with a huge amount of personal qualities of the positive side, but there also has to be a certain ruthlessness, ambition. I mean, what was it? what was it like for the playwrights she didn't like, or the agents she had to compete with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd just like to say something, because Christopher will answer that better than I do in, the, in, the, in those terms. But what, what, something I, 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 I was, was almost per perfectly paradoxical about Peggy with this pure and, 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 and well, Greek sense of the, the, the essence of things and, 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 and living to the absolute hilt and so on, uh, was that... Um, uh, she she adored um, making money. <laughs> she just loved it, and she was very very good at it. She prided herself on her genius at the roulette wheel, and I saw that in action. She really <laughs> just put it on that, dear. I'm never wrong, and and and, and, and it was indeed. She was right. We uh, we made a few bob out of that, and uh, um, uh, she she had uh, she was brilliant at, at at knowing which shares to buy. Uh, and uh, she bought shares in Holland and Barrett, and uh, rejoiced in the, uh, the, the, you know, the acceptance of the world's um, increasing interest in, in uh, the products uh, of <laughs> Holland and Barrett. <laughs> and um, uh, and she um, uh, and she loved doing deals. She was absolutely brilliant at it, even though a disapproving of the amount of money that her authors were about to earn, in their terms. She loved, and she pushed them <laughs> higher and higher and higher. And she had this sort of combination of, 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 of uh, financial acumen and absolute moral force, <laughs> weird combination, that uh, um, made most uh, of the people she dealt with uh, buckle completely, and uh, they, they gave in. But let, let's, let's come back to the question of what about the playwrights who she, who, who she didn't help up the ladder? I don't know what happened. To, I think they finally got the message and slipped away <laughs> to, to other agents. I don't really know what the answer to that is. But she was, there's a, 
uh, one of my favorite stories about her is that there's a, um, uh, a writer called Larry Kramer, an American writer, who had begun as a film producer. And he, made a, he produced the film of Women in Love that uh, Ken Russell made. And it was written, there was a script written by David Mercer, one of her writers that she particularly was fond of. Uh, uh, but it, at a certain point, it was decided that by Larry that he would write the script himse himself. And so David was let go. But there was an outstanding uh, amount of money uh, which was, had not been paid. So Peggy invited Larry Kramer mm. to lunch uh, on a Friday, and she was extremely uh, you know, open and friendly with him. And she said, come back to the office for a cup of coffee, dear. And so uh, he, she, he did. And uh, she said, uh, I'll make the, sit down, I'll make the coffee myself. And left the room, at which point he heard the key turning in the lock. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, um, Larry, dear, I hope you brought your checkbook with you. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I, and she said, well, the thing is, I'm going to Brighton. <laughs> and if you want to, you know, you can spend the weekend in my office if you want to. Otherwise, just slide the check under the door, dear. <laughs> um, which he did. And then a few years later, when he became a playwright, of course, the first thing he wanted was to make Peggy his agent. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Good exactly. tip, Mel, isn't it? <coughs> not, not yes, unfortunately, nobody does anything by check anymore. But no. that was, um, you, I mean, you, you asked about ruthlessness. I don't think um, necessarily there's a ruthlessness, but I do think um, a lot of uh, writers who've had very su successful careers are very good at helping an agent curate their career, so that there's a lot of, um, and it's down to hard work. I mean, a, a lot of it's, uh, you know, there's an enormous amount of talent needed. There's also hard work. And some writers don't know how to manage their own talent. And those are the ones often that fall by the wayside. They just cannot manage their own talent. Yeah. So they don't know how best to, yeah. and when I say exploited, I don't mean exploited in um, a, a, a financial sort of way. They just don't know how to preserve it and they don't know how to manage it, and no person, as an agent, you can help nurture and hold them in a safe place, but actually, unless they also have the ability to um, manage their own talent and realize it, you can't do anything. You but cannot make it. So as, as with books, as with anything else, you may always get a one-hit wonder, you know, the old thing that everyone's got a book yeah. in them, but there might only be the one. Yeah, and there's something about feeding your intellect and your own spiritual nourishment. There's all sorts of things, and I don't mean, you know, going to yoga classes or doing any of that. It's a very instinctive um, thing, how to protect your talent. A lovely story has just come to us from somebody uh, watching online, Sarah, uh, who says, I was taken to Peggy's office as a child. I was waiting outside while my dad, James Saunders, was in her office. Oh, yeah. There was so much shouting, I thought something terrible was happening to him. Later, he used to say, when someone asked him why he didn't change his agent, how could I be like trying to change your mother? <laughs> <laughs> Another question coming up here um, from Nicholas uh, James. Can, can you share with us how Peggy came to work with the literary agent Tom Erhard? Oh. Tom Erhard. Er yes. Erhard, yeah. yes. Uh, you know about well, yes, yes. Uh, I think he, Tom arrived about the uh, sort of late 60s, about the same time that I did. And he had been working for, he was an American uh, uh, who had been working for Peter Bridge, the, the theatrical producer. And somehow, Peggy... Uh, Stole him. What? Stole him. <laughs> Stole him, yes, she absolutely <laughs> nicked him. Be yeah. And he was completely the opposite of Peggy. So they were a wonderful couple because he was absolutely calm, collected, uh, knew... Uh, he was enormously knowledgeable. One of his... The, th the things that he knew about was which theatre in Bratislava was the better theatre to sell you. <laughs> I mean, he just knew everything. And, you know, he ran the Tennessee Williams estate, uh, and he was unflappable. He went to the theatre every single night, uh, and on his holidays he went abroad and went to the theatre every, every single, single night. night. Yeah. Yeah. And so where, where Peggy was a sort of whirlwind dervish, he knew his, his 
fund of knowledge was absolutely uh, unparalleled. He knew more about the the, the mechanics of, of the theatre mm. than than anybody I've ever met. I mean, Tom, I, I worked with Tom for a long time, and Tom was quite extraordinary because by the time I was working, I mean, he, he was the person who gave me my job, but um, he, uh, the older he got, um, I used to go to the theatre with him, and he was a big man. He was about six foot three, six foot four, Tom, and, and not skinny, not fat, but not skinny. Anyway, he'd sit and, you know, you'd see this big head, long, and uh, you'd think, oh, Jesus, fucking hell. Tom's fallen asleep again. But he would absorb the work by osmosis. Hmm. So you end the play and he'd go, oh, I didn't, I didn't like that girl in act two. And you think, you were asleep in act two, how do you know? <laughs> and he knew, he, 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 so he, he got so used to going to the theater, he could almost smell what was going on on stage. He never actually fell asleep. It was quite extraordinary. I <laughs> don't know how he did to this day, I don't know. So he was resting while watching and absorbing. <laughs> it was extraordinary. And another part yeah. of the brain, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yes, your point there, microphone's just coming your way, sir. Um, at least uh, three very good actresses have played her on the stage and on the screen. Um, I'm certainly not asking you, <laughs> you to make any comparisons, but when you um, saw any of the performances uh, for those um, that, that knew her, was there any particular aspect where you felt a real sense of recognition or something that uh, really caught your attention? Uh, well, I, I could answer that a bit because uh, um, in the case of um, Maureen Lipman, who was the first person to do Peggy for you, um, rather, as you know, uh, uh, Maureen was married to Jack Rosenthal, the playwright whom Peggy represented, but, but she was a wife and therefore <laughs> on the whole, kept at arm's length. Uh, and so when she was cast in the part, she took me for lunch and said, can you sort of really describe Peggy to me? And I sort of said, well, you know, I, well, I, 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 I did. And, and, and then, because, and, and, and I, I said, but her gestures were extremely um, original to her, a, a certain way of, using her hands, uh, uh, her tendency to lie out in rather <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> exotic odalisque-like uh, uh, yeah. flapping her dress and all the rest of it to cool her nether regions. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and she, um, uh, so Maureen said, well, I can't possibly do any of that. I mean, I'll just have to do it, you know, the way I read it. So I said, well, fine, go ahead. But actually, curious enough, when Maureen did it, she really did inhabit Peggy's uh, found, um, physical her. life remarkably. And then uh, Tamsin went through a similar sort of process. And, and they both found her physical life very, very, very well indeed. But the play didn't allow them fully to, to, mm. to, to show what Peggy was. But <coughs> then there's the movie. Mm. Well, now, she... The, the, the topic of conversation for about a year before the movie was made was who was going to play me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, she was fascinated by this. She'd yeah. ring up and say, they're suggesting Coral Brown, dear. Coral <laughs> Brown? <laughs> Never heard of it. And so as the different actresses were considered, she would, you know, be cheered up or, <laughs> depressed. or depressed. <laughs> uh, in the end, of course, it was Vanessa Redgrave, who was, of course, about a foot taller than <laughs> And Peggy, and not uh, not like her in any in any in any way, way at all. And Peggy was absolutely delighted. <laughs> but 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 by the by the time that that, that again Alzheimer's <coughs> has started to to, to invade her, um, I, I had directed Vanessa in um, Ballad of the Sad Cafe, and I'd been away from Peggy therefore for six months. That was the longest that I ever was away from her. And we had a little you know re re reunion. Uh, 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 lunch at uh, um, Sheikis, the old Sheikis, before uh, um, Jeremy King and so on took it over. And um, she said to me, uh, 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 I uh, told her about the film, and uh, 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 she, who, who were the actors? And I said, who they were. And I said, Vanessa. And she said, Vanessa, didn't I play her once? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> no, no, Peggy. Uh, she played you. Oh, <laughs> was she any good? 
And I said, no, 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 she missed you by a mile. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, she played you like an angel of goodness and light. Mm. She said, has she ever met me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more on the floor there? Did we have, uh, yes. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I've read a little bit about um, the sense that Peggy became sometimes disappointed with some of her clients, and I'm thinking about Robert Bolt in particular, where they were potentially lured away to the evils and great riches of television or film and to a lesser extent television. I don't know if you'd care to comment on, on that in relation to Robert or other clients. Um, well, I certainly, I mean, the thing was about, about films, Peggy knew that they were a source of enormous um, money, uh, but she didn't really approve of them or like them. And she was very upset about Robert Bolt having abandoned the theatre completely and, uh, you know, taken to writing these films. Uh, and the only... I, mean, I was with her for 25 years from the time I first met her to the time she died. And the only serious row we ever had was when I said I would like to take an agent in Los Angeles to look after... Uh, film, to, you know, to get me film work. Um, and she said, well, if that's the, the way, you, I mean, go. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I, you <clears throat> there's a difference between us. You don't like films. I really do like films. And I would like to be able to, to, write, to write them in, 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 not in opposition to or instead of, but in tandem with writing plays. And so well, doesn't it make sense for me to to have somebody who's really, you know, who can deal with uh, the film side of things where, uh, and take those anxieties off you, where, you know, because all you feel is disapproval <coughs> about it. And eventually we sorted it out, and I did get an agent in Los Angeles. Um, what was a slight mishap was that the agent in Los Angeles was an English woman, <laughs> uh, and therefore fell into two categories that... Uh, Peggy disapproved. <laughs> 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 so, so that so that it was never quite you know it was never quite resolved. But she really, she really did feel uh, um, personally afflicted by by um, the sort of biography or, or, or life trajectory of Robert Bolt and mm. and ten, ten, tended to use him as a. I mean, I remember being in, in her office once when somebody an, uh, f called from a theater in Washington um, to, to talk to, to about doing a play, I think called Brother and Sister by, by Robert Bolt. Anyway, something like that. And she said, well, it's an extraordinary thing about that play, dear, to this producer from Washington. She said, um, I mean, Robert has written it and rewritten it and rewritten it. And it just gets worse. <laughs> so I don't know what, which version you're planning to do, but none of them are any good. So the man was obviously baffled that he'd rung up to make an offer on this play. <laughs> she said, I'm sitting here with a young writer who's written a play called Total Eclipse. Why did you do that instead? <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very shocked. I said, Peggy, you mustn't do that. You don't do that. Anyway, they did do Total Eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mello, it, it, would you think it would be fair to say <laughs> that for everything we, we've heard about Peggy and her being an absolute true believer, as many of us are, at the, the live stage, live performance, people breathing yeah. the same air, is something that matters, that she would feel a bit thwarted by the way the theatre is today and the way that agents have to be today? Because you really have to be multimedia to a great extent, don't you? If, if your clients well, are I, going to... I mean, I, by, and large, by, by and large... Um, no, my playwrights write for the theatre, and some of them have made a small fortune, I have to say. I mean, uh, they dip, uh, a couple of them dip their toe in the film and TV pond, but a lot of them don't. But it's often, I mean, the perception is that it's, I mean, I know one, one young writer who's written one lovely play that was really yeah. good, and it got produced, and it was well thought of, and Michael Frayn came to see it and said, oh, that was the best first play he'd seen for ages. She has not written any more is working now in comedy script writers' rooms because 
because of the sense of security. I mean, that, that does happen, doesn't it? I mean, well, it does, but it also depends on your agent. So that if you have no interest in the theatre, and a lot of agents do, don't. But if, if don't somebody like this has written a play which didn't actually have, there was no agent involved, you know, yeah. the theatre simply took it up, did it, uh, you know. So, uh, I mean, what, what, I mean, surely that this does happen. I mean, this must happen to some people who feel I can make some money sort of hacking away in a writer's room. Yes, although I think, I mean, it's changed in the last two and a half years, three years, it's, it's become ridiculous with the uh, SVODs, which are, you know, the Netflixes and the Apples of this Big world. Streaming. It's, 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 I yeah, mean, there's so much thinking, shit yeah. that, that's out there. It's unbelievable, and who wants to add to that shit? But um, so, you know, it also dep it really does depend on your mindset. So, you know, if a young writer comes in and they've written a play and they walk in and they want representation and actually what they want to do is write for telly, I won't represent them. Mm. Because that's not where my passion lies. So the fact, and I also think there's a kind of consolidation of the talent and the voice, which are, if they go into series TV too early, actually you 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 haven't you haven't found your you may not have f fully found your voice. Mm -hmm. So actually, the only the only the danger of going into into series TV too early, i.e. Um, you go into a kind of, hom you, you, they want yeah. to homogenize your talent rather than um, celebrate its uniqueness, is that you do lose your voice. So I have had uh, one client who's actually terribly successful in TV, but um, uh, and he went into it very young and I doubt very much whether he could write a stage play that would be worthwhile staging there. What about, just one, one other question really, what about plays that are just the wrong time? You know, you, you oh, must sometimes, yes, any you agent yes, and, yes, and, yeah, and no, 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 actors no. as well, must suddenly come along and think, oh, you know, I love this, but it's so not going to get produced now. Yes, and some, some you fall in love with. There was um, a playwright called Robert Holman who wrote a beautiful mm. play mm. called Jonah and Otto. <coughs> beautiful. It took me four and a half years to get it on. Mm. And you just can't, if you, so the, that's the other thing about it. If you, if you really believe in theatre and if you really believe in writing talent, um, there can't be any cynicism because you are going to have to go through, um, you may have to go through, through some very barren times um, with writers. Not all of them can have a, a, an extraordinarily stellar career. So unless you actually love them and actually love their work, you can't sustain them in the bad years. And so you have to. You so have to really Coming right that. back round to think, Peggy, aren't we? Yeah, I think the, the, the most, <clears throat> perhaps the most unusual thing about Peggy in the sense of her being an agent, was that I think she really believed that it, it, the only way to make money was to have no interest in it whatsoever. And then it sort of came. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you went out looking for it, um, then you were somehow betraying yeah. your calling. You, you know, of course, yeah. of course my writers have to live Live, live, should live as well as they possibly can. But I don't, you know, she, she absolutely wouldn't, if there was a hint of, of anybody working for money, yeah. she got upset. And but, that was but, a great lesson yeah. for but all that, of us. But, but that was the, the complication with Bolt. It, it yes. That she had really engineered his success, <coughs> the mm. financial success in films. And so, of course, he became a bit addicted to the life that that gave him. Uh, and, and so, mm. so, and she felt a little bit guilty about that. Christopher, did that, did that bunch of fivers sort of ever happen to people? Or, or Simon, do you know? But did did she ever help people out? Oh yes, oh yes, right. in incredibly the, generous. Oh, amazing. In the she, you had to you had to stop her from. <coughs> I mean, I, I remember once I did borrow some money from her because I I just ran out, you know, as one as happens in this career, <laughs> and I borrowed some money from her, and then three or four years later I paid it back, and she said. She was most surprised because I think she lent her money to all her writers yeah, and yes, yes. didn't often or get you know, it back. If, if the roof fell in, then she'd just pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, ex extraordinary. But that was, but th that was absolutely that, uh, 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 something completely separate from her work as an agent. That was just her compassion as a person. She just wrote the check and never thought of it again. But I also wonder because I feel this s slightly. Um, I, I, I wonder whether her disdain for film and TV is, is there's a kind of 
pricing that goes on. So they, you know, they'll come back to your, you, they'll come <coughs> back to you when you're doing a negotiation and say, by the writer who's obviously never written a screenplay for Hollywood before, so what's his Hollywood quote? And um, and actually, it it is like there are prices, there, there are kind of stickers on the front of various writers' heads, and they're worth so and so, and they're worth mm -hmm. so and so. So it's all about the extrinsic value. It's not about the intrinsic value of the work. And I think that went against everything she held dear, and I completely understand it. Um, and also, it doesn't necessarily lead to good writing, because if you're paid a million dollars to write the first draft of the screenplay and it's shit, but you walked away with your million dollars, it doesn't matter if you don't get to write the second draft and the third draft and get to see the film made, you walked away with a million dollars. So in a funny sort of way, mm. it's anti-creative, you know, that kind of um, marketplace mentality, I think. So I can understand why it hurt her. She also was very, very generous in, in, in investing in plays. Yep. But her principle was that she would only invest in plays that she thought would lose money. <laughs> she s said, you know, if a play's going to run for a year and make money, well, they don't need my money. Uh, but if a play is really worthwhile and I want people to see it, I'll pay for it. She was, when, was it your, I've forgotten, was it Galileo? You, you, you were in something which she had put together. You know, she, she, she'd put the whole thing together. Uh, totally clips. And then, uh, to, oh, that was totally clips, wasn't it? And, and um, <coughs> then the, the music, the music was going to cost too much. So she oh, no, no, that's restoration. Well, that was in restoration, but she slapped the money down, basically, and said, I've got, I've got to have the but, Well, Bond, oh, she was so angry with Edward Bond, <laughs> who, always. But, um, <coughs> <coughs> but, but he wanted, um, he, he, he decided <laughs> that he, no, what it was was this, that she knew that it had been a very difficult rehearsal period, and by definition it would be, because Edward because was directing Edward, yeah. as well. And so she said, I want to pay for a party for the actors. And Edward said, no, that is wrong. Give me that money because I need it for more music. For the sort. She was so angry with him about that. But she did eventually give him the money and no party, and it was all incredibly fraught and unpleasant. We must mm. wind, wind up in a moment. <coughs> I just want to really ask the floor here. Do, do we feel we've met Peggy Ramsey? Yes. <laughs> Is anyone here who actually did? <coughs> no, but we, I, I've, I feel I've, I've met her more. <laughs> more personally than <laughs> I Is there any last thing any of you would just want to put on There's the record? Question. You've seen a hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I see a hand. I, I don't know if I might be wrong. I get the sense that she's actually quite shy. You know, this theatric, very, very theatrical. But the thing of putting those little eggs on your step, it's like someone who wants to um, say hello and does it in a shy way and then run away. I don't know. Is that wrong? Or what do you think? <laughs> Uh, it, it's a very counterintuitive word to, to use about <laughs> Peggy, um, but <laughs> I'm not sure that you're wrong entirely. There was a sort of, a sort of occasional bashfulness about her, but never, I think, in the sphere of playwriting. But flamboyant people sometimes are shy because putting she on a great big costume and a flowered dress and a yeah. hat she and was shouting very, at she people. She was very delicate in lots of ways. Yeah. She, she oh, was. And, uh, yeah. and she liked words like, I mean, a, w a word of praise about a, a play, for example, would be demure. <laughs> <laughs> demure piece. It's really. that floating silk skirt again. <laughs> <laughs> it meant that she liked it. Um, uh, so, yeah, she, she was a... She, there were many, um, many, many different qualities arrayed under that. I, yes, that was that was what was, she was Cleopatra like in that sense that there were, you know, a dozen Peggy's. And she gave us all some astonishing evenings in yeah. theatres. Um, we must come to an end now. Our time is technically up, I think. So thanks to all our panel: Mel Kenyon, Sir Christopher Hampton, and Simon Callow. Uh, thanks to the audience here at the British Library who have come out tonight and to anyone who's watching from home or may do in the future. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight's event, uh, please, as they say, do explore other events within the programme at bl.uk. It's the best website ever, bl.uk, very simple. And if you want to view previous events, you can find them all on the BL Player. 
um, to learn more about the Peggy Ramsey archive and countless others, they are available via the British Library reading rooms. And again, far more information always can be found on the website. Uh, but thanks to everybody from me. I've had a great evening. Uh, apparently the bar is open, so good night. <laughs>